Hi, I'm Al Paul, one of the support analysts at School Logic. Probably have, I've talked to you over the last two or three years, and I appreciate you showing up today for my recorded webinar, TLXE Building Blocks. This is the recording of a webinar that I did the final week of August of 2013. If you attended that webinar live and you showed up again, wow, I admire your perseverance. If you attended that webinar live and you had a little trouble with the audio, I apologize for that. There were some misunderstandings about how we were going to feed that audio. And if you made it to that webinar and you got turned away, I really apologize. I had no idea that there was a limit to how many people we could cram into the webinar room. So I apologize for that if that happened to you. And you already know that we're going to be at community.schoollogic.com because that's where you found this recording. Today's presentation is going to discuss the basic gradebook building blocks of teacher logic. We are going to concentrate on grading, not on attendance. We're going to concentrate on the basics of creating your class file in TLXE. For our display purposes today, we're going to be using TeacherLogic 3.4.58, which is the version I expect that most of you are using in the field. Our follow-on product, TeacherLogic 4, will be available in October. Those building blocks that we're going to be covering today include cumulative versus composite grading, weighted percentage versus total points, what parents see and probably what they do, extra credit versus bonus points, templates, setup reports that you can use this time of the year up front, and backups. Now most teachers have probably not heard much about backups, so you want to stay tuned for that. I'll probably tick off a certain proportion of the tech coordinators for even talking about those opportunities, but backups are good for teachers to be able to do. And we're really not going to cover much theory today. I'm going to mostly show you how to do things. But up front, there is one theory that I want to address first. What is the goal of your gradebook? Is the goal of your gradebook faithful and accurate recording of the scores your students achieve? Is it charting your students' progress? creating a written record to show parents at conferences. Well, I'm going to suggest a new goal. The best grade book is one that you can explain to parents. That's my goal. I want to help you create a grade book you can explain. I want you to be firm in knowing how you set this up, how the numbers you enter are used, the calculations that use them, and how the system arrives at the grades. I hope to help you with each one of those. And we're going to start off with a look at organization. Now, teachers spend most of their time in teacher logic in the task grid. And the task grid is kind of the fourth and, and lowest level of organization of this whole process in teacher logic. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. This is teacher logic. I'm in the setup screen, and the very first part about the organization that I want to address would be report periods. Report periods are the top layer of organization of how this all works, and report periods come from the school. You don't get to edit them. Report periods indicate a reporting time frame, and at this time of the year, that time frame you're going to start out in is report period one. Now you'll notice my particular example school here has four reporting periods. Your school probably doesn't have more than that. Four is pretty common. Three is common. Two is common. That's kind of the way most schools run. Can they be weighted? Yes. If they're weighted, they're weighted by the school, generally not by the teacher. My second level of organization is units. Units are these guys. Here's number one. Here's number two. Units can span multiple report periods, but it's probably easier not to. Units can be weighted, but they don't have to be teacher's choice. See this number here after, here's my unit name, quarter one. Here's this number, 
That's the weight of that unit. Now many teachers will have multiple units. What am I teaching here? Language arts? I could have grammar, I could have spelling, I could have all sorts of things down here. They would all be units and I'd have the opportunity to weight them or not. It's kind of cool, when you click on this guy, the little drawer comes out and that gives you these choices down here. If I click on edit, and let me bring this down here in the middle of the screen, you can see it better. I clicked on edit and the computer is going to give me in a second the parameters that I can edit about a unit. Cool thing about a unit is that it can be, you can say create them in all, so you'll have the same unit but separate in all of your report periods, or you can create a unit in an individual report period. Here I am in quarter one, and here's where I set that weight, so that weight is zero. Beautiful, I've got report periods, I've got units, and then the next thing that I have is categories. Categories exist within units, both categories and units can be added within multiple hosts. And by that I mean categories can be in multiple units. I said I might have a teacher that's got three, four, five, six units down the left here. I can have exactly the same categories in each and every unit. They will all be separate. So that if I had three categories here in each category, if I had three units here rather, and each of them had identical categories, we would always get our grades out of the categories first, and then those would make up my unit grade. It's not like I would be tracking my homework across all six units. Not quite like that. Um, but it's cool that you can have identical setups, and it's quite common, frankly, to have the same categories set up within each of your multiple units. That's fine, but Unit 1's homework always stays separate from Unit 2's homework. The next thing that we want to talk about is calculation types. Now we're getting down to the nitty and the gritty here. These are some really basic building blocks of teacher logic. Let's bring up a little document here, because this business about composite versus cumulative, we're going to bring up a little document to help us out. This little chart explains this very, very basic part of our software. So you've got composite, which is the Canadian phrase, or composite, which is how the Americans pronounce it. Either way, it means that the reporting period is self-contained. At the very, very start of everything, generally the school decides, are we going to do composite or are we going to do cumulative? Composite is self-contained. Think of it this way. Composite almost sounds like compartment. The grades are compartmentalized. The grades that Mary earns in report period one stay within report period one. See my little blue lines here? Each report period is an entity onto itself. The task grades stay in each compartment. Now, you can come up with a final grade, which is an average of the four compartments. You can even throw a test, final test in here and all that other business, but that's another story. The thing for you to understand about composite is it stays within the reporting period. Now, that's as opposed to what? It's as opposed to cumulative. And cumulative is what it sounds like. Think accumulate, because that's exactly what we're going to do here. With composite, you remember my little blue line stayed within each one of these, not with cumulative. With cumulative, my grades accumulate as the year goes on. And at any point in this year, at any point on this line, the grade that Mary has is an accumulation of all the tasks that she has worked on up until then. Now, you can have a final grade, it can be separate, it can be an overall average, but I'm telling you, at the end of report period four, the grade that Mary has right here is an accumulation of everything she's done up until here.
If you choose to have a final grade, that's fine. You can have a test in here, and then you can average this plus the test and get the final. But again, that's another story for another day. We wanted to get across cumulative versus composite, and it's my judgment, we probably have. Calculation types, we talked about cumulative versus cumulative. Now, the deal is, as I said, generally made school-wide. The decision makers actually change the settings so that teacher logic only displays the choice that they want you to have. And what I mean by that is, when you come in here to teacher logic, see how it says composite on the top of your setup screen? Now there's some variations of composite here where we're talking about ignoring some weightings, but you'll notice that cumulative is not even a choice. And the reason that is, is because the school decided up front that this school is going to run on composite. Now, if that hasn't happened at your school, get together with your peers and discuss it. Because these two different methods bring very different results. And if I'm a parent, it doesn't make a ton of sense to me to have one section of, let's say, freshman English, where it scored composite, and then another section is scored cumulative. Remember, teachers, Becky's mom talks to Catherine's mom. And if Beth, if Becky is getting scored composite and Catherine's getting scored cumulative, they're going to end up with very different marks and those parents are going to talk to each other and, and it's going to come back and then they're going to start asking you questions. When they start asking you questions, like about calculation types, it's really good to have the evidence. And so we're going to now explain another really basic building block, which is weighted percentage versus total points. More nitty and gritty. In fact, we're going to ask you to get the calculators out here because you want to be able to explain this to your parents. We're going to go back in here to this Word document that we've been using and we are going to pull up even more evidence than we looked at before. At the very, very top of this document we were talking about calculations. Here, we're going to do some actual calculations. Let's get this up here so you can see it well. We're going to start talking about weighted percentages. And as you can see, I have four tasks here. In row number two, I have the actual score. So Catherine got 25 out of 50, Catherine got 60 out of 100, you get the idea. Row number three, I have the percentage equivalent of that. So here Catherine scored 50%, here she scored 60%, you get the idea. In row number four, I have the weights, which is the most important part of this little chart. So task number one is weighted 50%. And the way we do the math on that is we say, it's, it's, I'm sorry, I just misspoke. It's weighted 1. Kids scored 50%. It's weighted 1. So the way we do the math here is we go 1 times 50. I want you to write down the 50. Our second task is also weighted 1. Kids scored 60%. So we say 1 times 60. I want you to write that down. We go to the third task and we see 2 times a hundred. Wow, how did we come up with that? It's weighted to the kids scored a hundred. Two times a hundred equals two hundred. Write that down. And we get to the final task. The final task is again weighted one. And we're going to say one times ninety-five. I want you to write down the ninety-five. Now, if you add up those four numbers I gave you, fifty, sixty, two hundred, ninety-five, you're going to come up with four hundred and five. I want you to divide that by 5, and if you do, you'll get 81. That's how it works. But wait, 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 wait. Why did I tell you to divide by 5? There's four scores here. Where did I come up with 5? Where I came up with 5 is, that's the sum of my weights. 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 1 equals 5. If a person's going to make a mistake here, let's say maybe a parent, it's going to be in this division step. Most parents would look at this, they divide by 4. 
Okay. By the way, if you divide by 4, you get 101.25. That would be wrong. You'd phone the teacher. You'd email the teacher. You'd complain. Okay. Let's look at our second example. Our second example is task number one is weighted 5. So Catherine scored an 87%, and you go 5 times 87. 5 times 87 is like 435. Write that down. Test number 2, weighted 1. 1 times 68 equals 68. Write that down. Test number 3, this one's weighted 2. Catherine scored 90. We're going to go 2 times 90, obviously 180. Write that down. Final task, weighted 1. 1 times 84 is 84. Write that down. Now the total you got is 767. Divide that by 9 and you'll get 85. Why did I pick 9? Because that's the sum of the weights. Add up the weights here. 5 plus 1 is 6 plus 2 is 8 plus 1 is 9. Okay? It actually comes out to 85.2 on most of your calculators. But there you go. That's weighted percentage. If a person's going to make a mistake, it's going to be they aren't going to divide by the right number here in general. Now, the alternative, of course, to weighted percentage is total points. And I will tell you flat out, I love total points because it is so straightforward. You add up the raw scores, you add up the possible points, and you divide the scores by the points. It is that simple. Okay? So in this case, Catherine scores 25 plus 60 plus 20, plus 95, she scores 200 points across four tasks. The out of number, which is another word way of saying possible points, my out of number is 50, then 100, then 200, then 100, that adds up to 270. If I divide the 200 by the 270, I get 74, okay? Maybe 75, depending upon how it's coming out in your calculator. You know what? It's that easy. Most of the parents will do the math like this, because they aren't going to really generally know how to do the weighted percentage business. Now, let, let me, I just want to show you something here, because most teachers, most of the time, really don't know what the parents are looking at. This is our home logic product. Home logic is the product that kids can go into and parents can go into and you can communicate with both of those audiences through home logic. And this is nothing, teachers haven't done anything extra to get this in here. Our software takes care of this. Here are the grade details for Language One Arts for that class that I've been working on in Teacher Logic. It starts out with the report period, it shows you the unit, here are all my task names, here are the dates of the tasks. I've got weights for the tasks. Parents aren't going to know what to do with these numbers, but they're presented to them. Okay? Overall, homework is worth 40, quizzes is worth 20, tests is worth 40. We'll get to those weights in a little while, but those are the weights of the categories. And if you follow the row along, that makes sense. Okay? I've got waiting for my assignments. Okay? My assignments I weighted very, very basically because I'm a total points teacher. I didn't use weighted percentages. Okay? I've got my points earned. This is what Catherine, or in this case, Alan, scored. These are the out of numbers, in other words, of points possible. And here is the percentage of each and every assignment. Okay? That's what parents actually see at home. So, Everybody take a breath. Those were the basics of how math gets done in teacher logic. You've got cumulative versus composite. You've got weighted versus total points. And you've got tasks which are part of categories, right? Categories are generally weighted. Let's look at this in a little more graphic idea here. Categories are generally weighted. And we do the math for each category first. So, for instance, here's my homework category. It happens to be made up of two tasks. So I'm going to do the math here. I'm going to average my two tasks based on total points, 
and I'm going to come up with a homework grade. However many quizzes I have, I'm going to average those out just based on total points. However many tests I have, I'm going to average those out just based on total points. I'll come up with a test grade, a quiz grade, a homework grade, and those will get averaged together based on 40, 40, 20 to produce the unit grade. The good news is I'm here to tell you that Teacher Logic 4 due out this fall will do its math in these very same ways. Okay? So that's not going to be a big relearning thing. So what else can we tell you about Gradebook? Do you know about grade status? Grade status allows you to have a placeholder or an explanation usually like maybe an illness or vacation could be any number of reasons it's a way for a teacher to show why a grade was what it was these things can affect a student the average of either the student or the class by the way if it affects them it's a zero or you can set up a grade status such that it will not affect the averages now let me tell you what I'm really talking about over here in the software. We have these things called grade statuses. And they are these placeholders, I'm sorry, that you get to apply. For instance, ABS in this particular school I'm at, student was absent during in-class graded activity. So the student receives this instead of a numeric grade. Notice that it says read only. And that goes back to the slide that I showed you just a second ago briefly. We believe as a best practice that grade statuses should not be something that teachers are creating on their own. We believe that grade statuses, and, and by we I mean several of, the, of my teammates, okay, it's not a corporate, it's not a corporate statement, it's a statement of Al and a bunch of the teammates. Look, if the, the district or the building should make the grade statuses. If teachers did that on their own, if you allowed each teacher to come up with their own grade status, you will end up with 12,492 grade statuses. Really, we did research, we know that. Many of those statuses will obviously be redundant. Now, now I'm not saying teachers are going to be redundant. I'm saying the grade statuses they create will be life will be less confusing and easier to manage if grade statuses are hammered out in staff meetings either by your department or your building or perhaps even by the whole division or district that's your business but our suggestion is have shared grade statuses don't let everybody create their own grade book setup more nitty and gritty about how this actually all comes together we're going to start with report period weights. Let's go look at what I'm talking about. Here I am in setup. I'm going to click on report period weights. When these come in, and I'll move them down here so you can see them better, when these come in you'll notice that I can't actually change these. Okay, I'm typing, nothing's happening. Grading period weights are set at the school level. The school has locked teachers out from changing those. That's another best practice we recommend. That way, every class is set up the same way in this very basic item. How valuable each reporting period is against the other ones, already taken into account. Grade statuses we already discussed. Let's talk about preferences. Preferences, we are going to display, we're going to just pick here, which items are displayed in our task grid? Are we going to display just period one, or are we going to display both periods? What about our units? What about our categories? Okay, I'm just picking what's going to show up over in my task grid. Setup. This is really simple, but very, very nice. Setup allows you to create defaults. So the next time I go to create a category, the category I create is going to be weighted percentage and it's going to be weighted 1. So this really increases the ease with which you can set up your gradebook. The next time I go create a task, hey, it's going to be weighted 1, it's going to be numeric, it's going to automatically be out of 100. I can obviously change this once I've created it, 
but having the default there is pretty nice. Notice there's a nice feature down here, and it's on almost all of these screens, that says apply to all classes. So if you have several sections, you can set up the preferences in your sections identically. Nice thing to have. Let's go look at task grid. Here you control what you see on the task grid. On the left hand side of this display, I always tell people more is better. The task column header, what we're talking about there is we're controlling the information at the top of your column that tells you about the task that you're working on. So the more pieces of information you have, as far as I'm concerned, the better. Cool thing on the left side of this display is that on the bottom on the left, I can pick to show my calculation type on the task grid. So on the task grid on the right hand side, it's going to say composite. So it's just a little reminder, how are my grades getting calculated? On the right hand side of this display, this is kind of interesting, it's probably the more important part of this particular display. I get to pick, on the right hand side of my task grid, is space for two different class averages. Well, I get to pick, do I want to show the report period class average, which is probably what a composite teacher picks? Or do I want to have grade to date, which is probably what a cumulative teacher would pick? And then down on the bottom of the right, I can control essentially that same question about the student average, not about the class average. Okay? So do I want to see my student average by report period, or do I want to see his average for the whole Bloomin school year? Most people, most of the time, will go report average, but I could see a cumulative teacher probably making this choice right here. The next thing we get to talk about is miscellaneous. These are some miscellaneous choices that you get to make about the, how this whole thing is set up. And the far left side of miscellaneous just shows options about displaying information about your students and even whether to display your withdrawn students at all. To me, the most interesting part on the left is limit task grid display to report period. Meaning, when you're in your task grid, do you want to see all of your tasks for the whole school year? If you do, don't check this. I think many teachers will say yes. I do want to limit the task grid because now I'm not scrolling left and right. I'm only bringing up the tasks that are within the current reporting period. Easier to control your display. On the right hand side, we see student sort order. Student sort order, the most interesting part over here, is enrollment date. Now here we are at the beginning of the school year, and most teachers most of the time will say, I'm going to sort my kids, you know, sort them down the left side of the task grid. I'm going to sort them by student name, in other words, alphabetically. Well, that's great, and then what happens is the word gets around to the other students about how great your section is. And being eager for interesting classes, they sign up for your class. Well, do you want all those new kids to just slide in here by last name? Okay, then leave this setting alone. But other teachers will want the new kids to appear at the bottom of their class list which is, of course, exactly how your little red grade book worked back when everything was on paper. So if you want that effect, say, sort me by enrollment date. Now, the final choice in the blue letters up here is this business about drop lowest and highest. And drop lowest and highest is pretty interesting, and it gives you the opportunity to drop one or more low grades for your student or you could drop one or more high grades. And you can do this by class. You could come in here and say, I just want to drop the one lowest grade that the kid earns in the whole class. Or maybe you want to do it by report period. You could do it by unit. You could do it by category. But what you probably don't know up front is that teacher logic does not pick lowest or highest based on raw points. It picks based on 
percentage. So, if Catherine scores 4 out of 5 on one task, and she scores 10 out of 15 on another, teacher logic actually drops the 10, not the 4. Well, why? Because 4 out of 5 is 80%, and 10 out of 15 is only 66%. Since 66% is obviously lower than 80, that's the one that gets dropped. Cool, eh? We're going to talk a little bit about the task grid itself. I want you to become a little bit more familiar with the geography of the task grid. This is where most teachers spend most of their time. You guys have been in here already, but we just want to touch on a few things. and. The thing about the task grid is I've got my blue area up here, which is the header. And remember a little while ago I said the more information you put in, the better. I was talking about being able to control the pieces of information about each of my tasks. Each of these is going to be, of course, a column of task-related grades. And if I picked everything on the left side of that preference display a little bit earlier, I get it all right here. Here's my kids. Here's my grades laid out left to right. And you probably already know that if you click on grades here, you're going to open a pop-up box and it's going to let you score every task that that grade is in. If you click on grade in the header, it opens a different pop-up box and it lets you score every kid in that one single task. You remember, of course, that each of these happen within pop-up windows, so hey, when you're setting up your browser, don't turn off the pop-ups. You want the pop-ups to show up. You want your pop-up blocker to be off. Now, the good news is Teacher Logic 4, coming out later this fall, works much more like Excel. There are no pop-up windows to do your grades. So in Teacher Logic 4, it's enter, score, hit enter, score, enter, score, enter, score, enter, you're moving left to right. Enter a score and hit return, you're moving vertically. So you can go score, return, score, return, score, return, score, return. That's how Teacher Logic 4 is going to work. I'm not going to have any pop-up windows. It's going to be sle sleeker, faster. See these red asterisks over here? Those tell you that grades have been entered since the last calculation. So it's time to recalculate and that's what you do by hitting the Calculate button. If your school gave you a Calculate button, so let me tell you about this Calculate button. If it's visible here, it means you have to run it manually in general. Okay, I entered a whole bunch of new scores. I'm going to hit the Calculate button. If I don't have a Calculation button, that means that your district tech people did not enable it and it means that calculations are done on TLXE in the fly. It probably means that you're on a pretty good network with a pretty good server. That's what that really means. Because we, we did originally have this calculate button in the software and we found out that when you got down to crunch time at the end of a reporting period and all the teachers are hammered on teacher logic, that some people's networks and servers didn't really get along very well with that condition. So. If you have a Calculate button, it most likely means that not everybody is going to hit Calculate at the same time. Therefore, your network traffic is down and your server demands are down because people hit this Calculate button at different times. It works out a lot better. So if you have a Calculate button, use it. If you don't have a Calculate button, it means it's going to happen on sort of on autopilot. Not a bad deal. Templates. Template creation. This is what I'm talking about. It is very, very nice because templates are going to allow you to speed up this whole setup process. And let's just show you how, what I mean about that. Let's go out to the class list. We're going to go out to the class list and once we get there you'll find that this display up here changes and now you've got this icon for templates. I'm going to click my template icon and the computer is immediately going to assume that I want to create a new one. Why, yes I do. Thank you. Once I click Next, 
the computer is going to ask me, okay, choose a template from, uh, uh, not choose a template, choose a class on which you are going to base the template. So I've got language arts pretty well set up right now. That's the one I'm going to pick. I'm going to go ahead and click next. In this next window, you should name your template something meaningful. You can come in here and say language arts. Ah, beautiful. One of the great things about doing this live without a net is that things happen to you along the way. Should not have gotten into that. Let's go back here and do the template again. Don't you love live demos? Okay, do we want to create a new template? Yes, we do. What class are we going to pick it from? We're going to pick it. We're going to base the template on language arts. And then we come up to the next window, and maybe if I do a better job of typing, this will be a better demonstration. Beautiful. You can enter a comment, something that makes it meaningful to you down the road to know what this is. You can choose to share the template basically within your building, or you can share it all the way across your district or division. And notice right up here up front, you can choose to tell the computer, hey, I want this whole thing, this whole template, to be composite or composite. Choose the next part here when we click Next it takes us to the opportunity to actually decide which pieces of your setup you're going to move along in your template. So the computer is going to say, do you want the units? Do you want the categories? Do you want the tasks? It's going to give you the opportunity. Because if you think about that from the perspective of how we're going to use this, if we want it to be a template for other language arts classes, other sections of the same class, then you probably want to include all of these items. But if you just want it to be, you're, you're saying, okay, I teach language arts, but you know what, I also teach English 9. And in English 9, I'm going to have the same units, I'm going to have the same categories, but I'm going to have very different tasks. So that's the beauty here of this particular screen. You can pick whichever components, either more or fewer, that you want to have in your, in your template. Templates are really, really helpful. I think you'll like them. Now, that's creating templates. Well, what about using them? How do we use them? Well, let's say we've got our templates created. And then we're going to go and we're going to pick a class. And these classes, because I've been working in here, probably I'm not going to get the command. I really, What I really want is when I click on a new class, if it's brand, brand new and I've never messed with it, it's going to come up to me and it's going to say, hey, there are no units in this class. Do you want to use a template? But because these classes, see, these classes I've been using, I'm not going to get that opportunity. So you should remember that when you have a brand new class, it's going to give you that opportunity. It's going to say, you know what, there's no units here. Do you want to create from a template? And that's going to be your opportunity. The cool part about that is that when you go in there and you say, OK, show me my list of available templates. It will show you the templates that you've made or that other folks have put out there for you to share either way. Then the next deal is it's going to say, OK, show me which class you want. Now, within that class, it's going to say, which elements do you want to bring in? So remember up front where we said, Yes, I want units and categories, but I don't want tasks. Well, the, kind of the same way. When you go to import your template, at, at, it will ask you, do you want the units? Do you want the tasks? Do you want the categories? And so you get to pick. 
templates can be edited in you know kind of in that way the other time saver I've got is if I go into my uh, let's go into my language arts class that I've been working on because there's a third and final time saver that's kind of a cool thing that you guys can use when you're working on your classes let's go into language arts and in the setup window where we're going to go here in just a second there's a nice thing called import task wizard and in the s because because think about this I've got three sections of language arts now at the beginning of the year I take section number one and I build it up and I get everything built the way I want it and then I create a template and I use that template to create section number two and section number three well maybe I don't have all of the tasks in there yet okay if I don't have all of the tasks in there yet then I go back and I build out section number one it used to have 10 tasks now I build it out and it's going to have 15 tasks well if he's got 15 tasks how am I going to get that task those new ones over to section 2 and section 3 the beauty of it is I'm going to use the import task wizard the import task wizard is going to let me go to that first section here I get to pick which section I have and then it's going to let me pick which tasks I want to bring in so if I already had one and two in there and three and four are not I just pick those two guys I pick import and I'm off to the races very very nice you know while we're talking about tasks we should talk about adding them I mean how do we really add a task well the way we add a task is by clicking on that window let's bring this down where it's better let me tell you about the add task window on the left hand side the coolest part about it is you've got this business of extra credit type and allow extra grades because I'm telling you most of the stuff on the left side of the task add a task thing is pretty much self-explanatory okay you got your name which category do I want it to be how does this business with extra credit type work well I'll tell you some people you'll come into their grade books and you'll see this and I'm going to tell you up front don't do that the software allows you two different ways to create the opportunity to have extra credit it offers you this opportunity called bonus grade and it offers you this opportunity called allow extra grades and let me caution you not to choose both if you choose both all bets are off seriously look it up in the owner's manual it says unexpected results will occur so don't do this let's consider bonus grade first because it's on the top right bonus grade if I pick that it means that this task that I'm creating is optional if a student does the task great she earns points if the student does not do this task it's not held against her the out of score the points possible don't come back later to bite her in the backside any points that she would get are added to the category grade in whatever category you create this task but the out of number doesn't get added anywhere in fact you don't even need an out of number now whether you pick grade to date or whether you pick report period averaging either one of those will work with bonus grade if we don't pick bonus grade we might pick allow extra grades and this is a little more straightforward it creates the opportunity for a student to score higher than the out of number so if my out of number is a hundred Jackie might score 105 on this and you create that opportunity by saying hey I want to allow extra grades the out of number does matter here because that out of number gets figured into the math just like any other assignment but the kid could score 102 out of 90 so that's essentially 12 bonus points that's the left side of our add task form on the right hand side 
is this opportunity to set a task as an assignment. And so the logical question is, well, what's the difference? And, and I tell you, I got to tell you, I have great difficulty teaching teacher logic because I just want to call everything an assignment. I have had to work at this presentation today to actually use the word task. But technically speaking, those places, those little buckets into which you throw points to reward students for their efforts, those little buckets are called tasks. Now, the two main differences between tasks and assignments are A, how and where they're viewed in home logic, but more importantly, assignments can have attachments. Actually, adding attachments is beyond the scope of today's session, but an attachment could be reference materials that would aid a student do the work. It could be a detailed explanation of your assignment. You know, perhaps the assignment is a multi-part semester-long assignment. you got to explain to the kid as he's going along. Okay, great. That makes a nice attachment. Attachments are pretty cool. Now, it's something that the teachers will put out there as part of the assignment. And in home logic, the parents can see the attachments. The students can see the attachments. For this to work, your tech staff has to do some work behind the scenes to allow the attachments to occur and be shared and all that good business. But that's a one-time setup. And thereafter, you can attach materials or references or web addresses to assignments where the teachers, the, the teachers put them out there, the parents can get them, the students can get them. The bottom line here of this right-hand side of this form is that attachments go with assignments. They don't go with tasks. And oh, by the way, there is a spot in the preferences that you can say to the computer, hey, every time I create a task, I just always want that task to default to be an assignment. You can do that as well. I promised you at the top, we talk a little bit about reports. Well, at this time of the year, these four reports are often being used by teachers as they prepare their gradebook before the kids get here. One report is gradebook setup, and it gives you a very nice overall view of your total setup. So you can see your tasks, whether you're composite, whether you're uh, doing the average thing, where you're doing total points, all of that stuff is on paper for you to look at in one place in gradebook setup. Comment codes, many teachers like to print the comment codes out to paper rather than, uh, you still have to pick them from the drop down when you actually assign them, but they like to have the comment codes on paper so they can look at them before they're making their choices. Grade legend, nice report, shows you the legend that's been assigned to your class by the school. What's an A worth, what's a B worth, what's a C worth, that sort of thing. And then the class list, hey, which smiling faces were assigned to you? That's obviously the simple part of what is a class list. I want to touch just ba ba briefly on outcome-based reporting. It's becoming more popular now. Outcome-based reporting is based around these things called objectives, which are created at the school level and then assigned to your course. And they get written out from either SIRS or school logic into teacher logic. The school determines which objectives count in which report periods. Now, teacher logic doesn't really do math on these. You guys, your professional educators, you evaluate and record your student progress against those objectives. And at the very top today, I talked a little bit about backup. I said make sure you hang around for backup. This is the part of the presentation we talk about backup. Ordinarily, when you go to your tech staff and you talk to them about backup, they are thinking of backing up the entire SQL database because that's their only choice. That's how it works. So if you had a big incident in one of your grade books and you just totally messed up the whole deal and you want to restore from backup, in our architecture, it's not just you. Okay. Let's say it's noon on Wednesday, and you've been working all morning Wednesday, and it's not going well. It's not doing what you want. It's all messed up. Well, if the tech people have a backup from Tuesday night, that's the one they'll read back in. It means 
that you will have lost all of the work you've done this morning. Except it's not just you. Everybody in the SQL database will lose whatever they've done up to this morning. They've done during this morning. Okay? The other teachers in your building, the secretaries in your building, the principals in your building, you get the idea. But wait, there's more. Not just the people in your building, all the people in all the buildings in your division or district. You're getting this idea that you might just want to find a rock and hide underneath it or something. This is not a great answer. However, we have built into our software the ability for teachers to do backups of just their stuff and do it on their own. Okay? Your tech staff creates a shared location and creates an opportunity for you to do this in another piece of software called Logic Admin. Each teacher can back up his or her own files and you get to do it one class at a time. So if you just messed up one section of language arts, you don't have to restore all of your classes, you just restore the one class. Generally, teachers can read them back in, meaning restore, generally without tech help. You can make the backup without tech help once you do it a little bit, and you can read them back in. And you can restore as little as one class. Not only can you restore as little as one class, you get to choose which areas to restore. Okay? You should talk to your tech staff about these possibilities. When up on the community.schoollogic.com site, we will also have materials that tell the tech staff how to set this up and materials aimed at the teacher, and it's only a six-page document with plenty of pictures, how to make your own backups and how to restore from the backups. Nice. That, ladies and gentlemen, are the basic building blocks of our gradebook in teacher logic. And why does that all matter? Because the best gradebook is one that you can explain to your parents. And I hope I've helped you down that road today. If you have questions after listening to this, email your questions into the uh, portal, uh, ConnectWise, the portal that we have where we interface with all of our clients. Uh, drop us an email, uh, see if we can help you out with what the questions are. Thank you so much for sitting through this. I hope you picked up a little something. I hope I helped you out today because I really do want your grade book to be something that you can explain to the parents.